Welcome to Bullet Points, the show that takes the mystery out of what makes proposals and sales presentations persuasive. I'm your host, Chris Sant. Hey, that's me up there. As you're able to see, this video is a little different than my bullet points normally are. And I'm putting this together because I recently got back from the APMP conference and over and over again, people are reporting the same problem. And the problem is with your sales structure and it's costing you millions or tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Now this video is designed to be forwarded by proposal people who may know me to folks in sales leadership who maybe don't. If I were you, I'd wanna know who I was listening to. So I've trained over 4,000 sales and proposal people. My clients like Wells Fargo and Manpower Group and WebMD have a market cap of over $340 billion. I've spoken at the APMP 10 times now. I'm a graduate of Stanford Law School, former commercial litigator where I had clients like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. So that's who I am. What's this video about? Well, it's about structural issues with your sales organization. What we've found is that most sales organizations have serious problems, and you're probably already well aware of the gulf between sales and marketing. For instance, 60% of companies don't even have a common definition of a lead. Only 27% of B2B leads are qualified. Only about 30% of CMOs have a process for bringing sales and marketing into alignment, and it's probably costing you around 10% or more of revenue per year. On the other hand, if you have good alignment between sales and marketing, you have about 32% annual revenue growth compared to a 7% decline for people who don't have good alignment, and you have 27% faster profit growth. Likewise, 36% higher customer retention rates, 9.3% higher sales quota achievement rates. The point of all of this is that it's not cherry picking data. The data backs up the common sense. When everyone on our side is working together and we're giving the client what they want, we do better. Except, are we giving the client what they want? And this brings up a serious structural issue that has to do with proposals. Over 70% of companies treat proposals as sales support. And that number is over 90% for B2B companies, as opposed to those serving government clients. Proposals are given almost admin level responsibility, basically no training. And in part, it's because some people trained in that old school sales way still have a very salesperson centric view of selling. They see proposals as a glorified price quote or as just memorializing what the salesperson already worked out. Now, if those things were consistently true, that would be fine, but they're not true, especially among larger clients and with bigger deals. In other words, that old fashioned view of proposals is very self-centered. It is not client centered. What we need to do is think for a second about why clients even started asking for proposals in the first place. B2B buying decisions are made by groups of seven people on average. And then you've got another 5.4 people on average who have veto authority. In other words, the world has moved on to a consensus based decision making process companies need change that will gather widespread support. And that involves consensus and compromise between internal stakeholders. But most vendor companies, in other words, your sales organization, are still stuck in a salesperson centric sales process. The problem though, is that companies are not going to allow your salesperson into that consensus building meeting. It's just not going to happen. You do have a representative there though, but it's your proposal. It is not a salesperson. So if you're treating proposals as a price quote or as mere sales support, and you're continuing to be salesperson centric, what you're trying to do is get clients to change their decision-making process so that you don't have to change your sales process. This is quite obviously a mistake because the sales process, even at most B2B companies, are still completely salesperson centric and they all derive from the Dale Carnegie model of almost 100 years ago. And this is despite overwhelming evidence from clients that they've invested time and money in RFPs because they're going to make the decision based on the proposal. Clients are telling you how they'll make the decision 
and we're continuing to not even listen to them. So if your company is still using methodologies like the sales funnel here, developed in the 70s or 80s, or you know the modern derivatives of those methods, it probably ends up looking something like this. Marketing, they bring in a lead or a RFP mysteriously shows up in your inbox. So sales runs over and asks a lot of questions that everybody knows are designed to gather ammunition to sell them something. And then sales does some demos and they talk about features and benefits. And it's all designed to show how great we are. And all of the slide decks start with those 12 slides all about us and where our offices are. And, and then despite that, the prospect for some unknown reason asks for a proposal anyway. Even though your salesperson is pretty sure they did all the things that they were supposed to do in order to get in front of the RFP or prevent the RFP or shape the RFP or you know whatever it is you're trying to do. So the salesperson writes up a superficial deal summary or blue sheet for proposals to use because you know, proposal is basically just a glorified price quote anyway, right? And because they're treated as sales support, proposals is swamped with too many proposals to do and too few resources to do them. So they copy and paste as best they can to meet the deadline. And this ends up being all about us because, well, you know, the proposal writer knows plenty about us and pretty much nothing about the actual client. And then there's that period of panicked questions and price cuts because prospects are evil and ruthless and they're just going to choose based on price anyway, right? And then we find out the result and we either pat ourselves on the back if we won because we knew it the whole time and I told you so, or we blame the clients if we lost because they probably chose based on price. The problem is that this does not work for a huge segment of your prospects. And let me emphasize that this is not because your salespeople are doing anything wrong. They're probably doing exactly what they were told to do. No, the reason is that the old system doesn't work for new clients in that how companies make decisions has changed. There are two reasons why a client would ask for a proposal. Either it's required, like in government bidding, or it's desired. In the commercial B2B world, over 95% of the time, it's desired. Now, let me ask, if clients make the decision based on the salesperson, how do you explain this? Likewise, why do companies request proposals and not more or different salespeople? How is it that better proposals bring more wins? Plus, why do companies spend thousands of dollars in time and money on RFPs if they don't care about the proposal? And how do you explain the existence of RFQs and RFIs, which are basically the equivalent of sales and marketing, respectively? The reality is that a salesperson-centric method does not work for over 95% of government clients and 40 to 80% of commercial clients, including over 95% of blue chip commercial clients. Now, why is it that those large accounts are so similar to government clients? Well, you know, the US is the biggest economic entity in the world. And the next eight biggest, no big surprise, we've got China, Germany, Japan, and so on. And then what's number 10? Walmart. Yeah, bigger than Australia, bigger than South Korea, bigger than India with a billion people. Exxon is number 21. Apple is number 25. These companies are bigger than 150 actual countries. And it's not just these mega companies. After all, your city or your town has a city council where they debate the text of laws. They don't try to memorize the details of a law based on a PowerPoint demonstration. But somehow we have this old fashioned idea that companies where people's jobs and promotions and livelihoods are on the line, they won't do the same thing as a city council. They won't debate the text of a proposal as compared to another proposal from one of your competitors. It just doesn't make any sense. Why else do people want proposals? Well, I mean, complex sales takes several months and over the course of those months, new information arises, solutions change, even if it's not intentional, a salesperson might forget to update everyone or not have access to updating everyone. But of course, companies are actually worried that you are promising one thing to one stakeholder and something else to a different stakeholder. And let's be honest, sometimes that's exactly what salespeople are doing. The proposal forces all the promises out into the open. And even if they're not worried about ethics, there are practical issues. Selling them your IT consulting or your intranet or your engineering plan, that might be the biggest thing in your life. That's the whale of a deal that you are hunting for. Okay, good. But you're lucky if getting some IT consulting is one of the top 25 things in their life. They have plenty of other things on their plate. And there's 
nine vendors, they're not going to make their decision based on what they sort of kind of remember your salesperson saying to the four out of seven people on the selection committee that he was able to talk to over the last three months. Or maybe it was one of the other vendors who said that. I can't remember anymore. I mean, isn't it pretty obvious that the written proposal that they have sitting right there in front of them is what they're going to use to make the decision? And that's assuming the same people are even there to make the decision who were there three or six or 12 months ago when this all started. Average corporate turnover is 15.1%. So if your selection committee is just six people, there's already a one in three chance someone has left after three months. And if 10 people are making the decision or get a veto, the odds are 50-50 that somebody is new after just four months. But remember, the actual average is seven people making the decision and 5.4 with veto authority. These are just the realities of daily life at your prospect. But there's also a bigger cultural change that has happened over the past 20 to 25 years. A large segment of companies driven by the purchasing revolution of the mid 90s, where procurement assumed so much power has reformed their decision-making model to eliminate the inefficiencies of making purchases based on backslapping and here's two tickets to the game. Instead, they are driven by building consensus and creating compromises among internal stakeholders at the company in a way that delivers the most total value possible. And there's literally no other way to do it than the RFP and commercial proposal. Yes, of course, marketing is extremely important for getting you noticed, getting you in the conversation in the first place. And salespeople are extremely important for when the prospect is trying to figure out the shape of their problem and trying to get a handle on what a solution looks like. But for these clients, the proposal represents the final stage in the decision-making process. It's not a glorified price quote. It's not a formality. No, this is where the client tells all the vendors to put their cards on the table and step back so that the client can make the decision. To address the memory and turnover and ethical problems, proposals force each supplier to consolidate all of their claims into a single document that all company stakeholders can see. And proposals require each supplier to actually commit to a recommended course of action at an associated cost. So that the selection committee can make the best possible decision, proposals serve as a final reference point with which companies can make comparisons between vendors. Proposals are also where you show the value you provide to allow stakeholders to make compromises, and proposals allow the company to build a consensus and momentum for change. The problem is that all of the sales methods out there were created before this happened, back in the Dale Carnegie world. None of them address the current reality of what these customers want. Now, you know, the Dale Carnegie model is fine for smaller and some medium-sized companies and for the very occasional large company where the head of the division is still allowed to get away with micromanaging everything. But the majority of medium and pretty much all large companies want proposals because it helps them do their job better. There's simply too many competing demands on their time and resources. From these clients' point of view, 99% of salespeople's attempts to manipulate them into changing RFPs or not issuing one, they are childish, bordering on ridiculous, and they wonder why you won't help them make the right choice. Not to mention that they wonder what you're afraid of, which is actually a pretty darn good question. There's also a practical matter of the fact that when it's just the selection committee talking, even people who say they support you won't be willing to actually speak up for you if they don't feel safe doing it. Research in the Harvard Business Review showed that in a survey of nearly 600 B2B buyers, fully half the people who reported a willingness to buy a product or service were not willing to publicly advocate for it. Your proposal serves as a cheat sheet of the arguments and the reasons that they should be making to the selection committee. Otherwise, you know, somebody else's arguments and reasons will carry the day. And again, it's not because the client chose based on price. It's because you chose not to give the client what they wanted to make the decision on. From the client's point of view, trying to stop them from issuing an RFP produces pretty much the same feelings that you would have if a car salesman told you, you don't need to talk to your husband or wife before buying this car. I mean, you just look naive if you aren't ready for it. The point is that there is a large customer segment for whom the proposal is not sales support. 
It's everything. It is the final decision step. This is why better proposals improve win rates. It's why companies want proposals. And what this also means is that if you generate significant revenue from proposals, you really need to rethink your sales structure so that for clients who are going to make their decision based on proposals, sales, marketing, and proposals are all aligned and doing their jobs as effectively as possible to generate persuasive winning proposals and to a lesser degree, the final sales presentation, which are basically a distillation of the key points of the proposal. What does this look like in real life? Here's uh, Apple's new headquarters, nice and shiny. And here's your selection committee and some of the senior managers who will take a look at the results and veto it if they don't like what they see. And they're located over here. But you know, these guys are looking at solving another problem totally unrelated to you. And so are these guys and all of them. Oh, and all of these guys off in the satellite offices. And since 30 to 40% of RFPs result in no decision, there's probably only a budget for seven of the 10 of these. So can you see why having a written sales document that shows your value and explains how you help Apple achieve Apple's company goals is useful? Useful to the new people, the forgetful people, the ones who are too scared to speak up, the senior managers who have bigger issues to deal with, and the executives who have to make final decisions on which seven of the 10 winners are actually gonna get funded. Yet, most organizations churn out generic, flabby, black and white, jargon-filled, marketing speak, all about us proposals that look just like everybody else's proposals. So the client ends up looking at 10 almost identical proposals. You can see why we call these proposal penguins. They all look exactly the same and it's impossible to distinguish between them. I mean, look at these. How does it help the individuals on the selection committee or the senior managers above them or the executives above them? Sometimes people say, oh, but nobody actually reads the proposals or they just skip to the price. And you know, it may very well be true that your proposals are not very good and nobody wants to read them, but that says nothing about what the client wants to make a decision on. All it says is that you are losing revenue because of poor proposals. As I pointed out during one of my talks in New Orleans, this is not what clients want. Generic about us proposals are rated lower than ones that address what the client cares about. No surprise there. But what may be a surprise is that proposals that people actually choose are overwhelmingly the ones that can only result from marketing, sales, and proposals working together. Sales needs to find out the specifics of what matters to this particular client. Marketing needs to bring in the awards and recognition that let us support our unique value proposition with evidence. And proposals needs to deliver it all in a persuasive, memorable way that connects all the dots for the client and makes it safe and easy to decide in our favor. But obviously that's not the current state of things. What this all means is that companies who generate significant revenue from proposals need to rethink at least part of their sales structure so that for clients who are going to base their decisions on proposals, proposals is not sales support, but rather for these clients, all the evidence that marketing is creating and all the client intelligence that sales is gathering is aimed from the beginning at producing a persuasive winning proposal and sales presentation. Now the payoff here is huge. Better proposals by themselves already produce an average increase in win rate of about 39%. And that's based on a survey of 180 Fortune 500 clients. Averaged across industries, that translates to about $9.4 million in additional revenue per 100 million that you bring in now. And that's because we basically teach proposals to create the evidence and gather the client intelligence that marketing and sales aren't doing right now. But you know, isn't it much more efficient for everybody to just do their jobs and do it in a way that will result in revenue and wins right from the start? Indeed it is. When you get everything aligned and everyone doing their job, the sky can be the limit. We had a client who was one of the top five facilities management companies in the US. They did this, they got sales, marketing proposals working together to show value in the way that their largest clients wanted. And they went from a market share of about 20% to winning 92% of them over the next year. So if you're in charge of a sales organization at a company with decent name recognition, you really can have tremendous success. So what do you do? We're simply moving to a reality-based selling process. You should acknowledge this reality, identify these clients, 
and meet their decision-making needs, just like you would introduce any other product to meet customer needs. Think of your proposal or your sales presentation as the first product that they buy from your company and they're paying for it with their time and energy and effort. So respond intelligently by giving them what they want to make the decision on. If that's a salesperson, fine. If it's a proposal, fine. Ultimately though, it means you have to stop living in denial. Accept that some clients make their decisions based on proposals. This includes large companies, consensus-driven companies, companies making major purchases where the sales cycle is more than three or four months, as well as, of course, government clients. Now, depending on your industry, about 40 to 80% of your B2B clients are going to use the proposal as the final stage in their decision-making process. What about those stories you hear about preventing the RFP in the first place? With your remaining clients, you know, that's entirely possible. With these clients though, maybe it happens 3% of the time. Maybe your salespeople are really good though, so they can prevent the RFP 10% of the time. Don't screw up the other 90 possible deals because you're focused on the 10 where they manage to avoid an RFP. Those 90 deals are not about getting the lowest price. They're about the company trying to make the best possible decision to get the most possible value. That is a perfectly acceptable thing for your client to want to do. And you're not going to stop them from doing it. All you're going to do is ensure that one of your competitors wins the deal instead of you. You have to stop forcing a salesperson-centric sales process on consensus-driven decision makers who need the final proposal to generate that consensus. How do you know if this describes your organization? Well, the best way to get started is to look at your data, of course. How often do you actually prevent an RFP from going out? 10% of the time? 5%? But unless you're preventing the RFP from going out more than 80 or 90% of the time, you've got a problem. Because if even 20% of your prospects are making decisions based on the proposal, and you're just providing those generic proposal penguins that we talk about, you're losing money, okay? Another way is to ask your star reps. Every rep is sure of their own importance, and that's fine because they are important. But you'll typically find that about 25% of your reps are ahead of you on this already. They already intuitively recognize that many of their clients really value the proposal. And so these are the ones that go above and beyond what others do in terms of working with the proposal team. And there's gonna be a high correlation with your star performers. This is not a coincidence. These people are already trying to adapt to the preferences of different clients. They're just constrained by the current setup. We have had multiple chief sales officers and vice presidents of business development relate almost the exact same scene to us and see if you can visualize it yourself. They say they're sitting in their office and they've been thinking about whether this applies to them and their clients. They see one of their star performers walk by, so they call out to them and they say, hey, let me ask you this question. Do we have a distinct segment of clients who are going to make their decision based on the proposal no matter what? Clients who use the proposal as the chance to make comparisons and build consensus and make internal compromises among stakeholders because that's what works for them. What you will find, because what they have found is that examples will start pouring out from the salesperson of clients who have done exactly that. They end up making trade-offs on multiple things that the client was dealing with in order to build consensus and set budgets and do their resource planning. And like it or not, your solution was just one small part of that. And finally, you know, if you have a good relationship with your clients, just ask them. I mean, as always, you have to use your judgment about whether they're trying to spare your feelings or keep influence for themselves or all those other things that clients do. But most clients will be pretty straightforward that yes, it would make their life a whole lot easier if your proposals were better. They would have more ability to argue for you and justify you and show why the company as a whole would be better off with your solution than with some other things that some other department or division wants to do this year. This is their day-to-day -day reality, but because we don't see it, we are not adequately accounting for it, and so we are not helping them through that process. Okay, so let's say you checked and it's true. Now what? Well, right now you probably have a typical organization set up where the salesperson makes all the decisions, 
proposals are seen as sales support with almost an admin function instead of a professional function, and the result is that they are overwhelmed and they only have time to produce those generic proposal penguins. And you probably have a one-size-fits-all sales process. Even if you have key account managers, that sort of thing, that's still just a higher class of the same thing as everyone else. Now, if that works for you, especially for small and medium-sized clients, where there really is one person making the final decision, that's fine. You should keep that exactly how it is if it works. But for larger and consensus-driven clients who have a ton of competing priorities and stakeholders and who need proposals in order to make decisions, because these companies are the size of small countries, we really recommend carving out a distinct group who knows how to gather and use information in a way those clients want. We strongly recommend that you develop a cross-functional team, which we call a SEAL team. Now that stands for Sales Excellence Alignment and Leadership, but you know, the truth is that mostly we chose it because SEALs eat penguins, and you're creating a team that will eat your competitors' proposal penguins for lunch. So this team is made up of specialists for clients who make their choice based on proposals. Decisions are made as a cross-functional team in efficient kickoff meetings where everyone is contributing their bit of expertise. The team is jointly trained, so marketing knows what you need, sales knows what to get, proposals knows what to say, and they are laser focused on persuasive winning proposals and presentations that correspond to how these clients make decisions. So that means the marketing members of your SEAL team are out there gathering the evidence you need to prove your value claims. No more unfocused and useless press releases full of leading edge of this and disruptive that. The sales members of your SEAL team are uncovering at a much deeper level what the client values and why, and what the client sees as a cost and why. No more self-centered features and benefits demonstrations, no more scratching their head that 12 slides all about us and a lot of unproven claims of innovation and partnerships didn't prevent the RFP from going out. No more blaming price as an excuse for not being prepared and not giving the prospect what they want. And the proposal members of the SEAL team are linking all the information and evidence together in a memorable message. They are showing that if the prospect really wants to solve their problem and achieve their goals and capture all this value, their only option is to choose you. And they're doing it in a proposal that has been designed from the start for just this moment. From the selection committee comparing you to nine other vendors, all the way to the executives haggling over budgets upstairs. A winning proposal combines the best of what marketing came up with, the best of what sales came up with, as well as their own expertise and skills in order to make it easy and safe for everyone to choose you. And the way we accomplish this is with the three-step awe process. It's designed to put you back in control of your sales process by not being at the whim of clients whose decision-making needs you are not currently meeting. It starts with an analysis of your current clients, competitors, proposals, presentations, deals you won versus what you didn't, and so on. It gives everyone a complete understanding of where you are, as well as where you want to be given your client mix. From there, assuming there's significant additional winning to achieve from a more responsive sales process, we help you carve out your SEAL team and train them on the best practices of what it takes to win these deals. What information you need and why. What evidence you need and why. How to put it all together and why. This is something that's often done at clients' regularly scheduled sales conferences since it makes it so convenient. And we've developed some you know, pretty cool techniques to make it easy to understand and easy to remember, easy to apply. But I think the biggest and the best thing we've done is to develop a format that puts teams of sales, marketing, and proposals into a state of flow. That's that experience where you're totally absorbed and involved and you're working in harmony, where you see your team members as integral to your success. So you finally get it on a deeper level, what it is that they do. Now, the best practices that we teach, they're not difficult, but they're not necessarily intuitive either. So to ensure that everything sticks, and that the best practices endure will likely make recommendations for your specific people. It might be as simple as coaching and follow-up, or, or it may make more sense to provide your people with a library of proposal and presentation material covering the main areas of concern in order to get them over that last mile. Whatever it is ends up being tailored for the client and the particular strengths and challenges of your team and your market position. So that's the issue, that's how you fix it. If someone forwarded this to you, I'm sure it's because they want to help your company be as successful as possible. And what I've said here matches up with what they've seen out there in the trenches. 
If you want to know more, give Dwight or me a call or send us an email. We're happy to talk with you, answer questions, provide references, explore your particular situation. Obviously, there's no obligation or anything because, you know, this may not apply to you. But if it does apply, it's almost certainly going to be worth addressing. And we can give you an idea of the sequence of steps it takes, who you want to be involved, what the cost is likely to be, and what results you can realistically expect. I hope this has been helpful. Look forward to hearing from you, and I wish you much success. Mm -hmm.